Hello and welcome to our video summarising all you need to know about the poems of the Decade Anthology. My name is Barbara and in this video we'll examine all of the poems contained within this anthology. We'll also look at the biographies of each of the poets as well as examining in detail the analysis that you should consider when you're com comparing these poems as well as the relevant poems that you can co cross compare from the anthology. So let's get started. The anthology begins with the poem Eat Me by Patience Agbabi. A little bit about the author herself. Agbabi is well known for her performances as her writing blurs the boundaries between performance poet and page poet and she does this with many other boundaries including both racial and sexual. She was born in London in 1965 to Nigerian parents and fostered by a white English parents in North Wales. She was educated at Oxford University and she's appeared at numerous venues in the UK and abroad and R.A.W., so Raw, her groundbreaking debut of Collection of Poetry was published in 1955. When it comes to her work as a poet, she combines experiments in performance, including being a member of Atomic Lip, which is poetry's first pop group, with a fascination with traditional poetic forms and the use of persona to explore her themes. She's undertaken many residencies and her work has been broadcast in TV and radio. Now, when we consider Eat Me and how this poem combines both Patience and Bubby's background, but equally the themes contained within the poems. The poem itself is an audacious, dramatic monologue, which examines an extreme kind of unhealthy relationship. Agbabi uses relationship between the feeder and the feed e to explore issues of gender and power. That the concerns of the poem are not confined solely to sexual politics is hinted through some of the language used to describe the woman's body. Forbidden fruit, breadfruit, desert island, globe and tidal wave are just some of the terms the, po the poem uses to describe the woman's body. These suggests a post-colonial viewpoint in which the colonial authority, identified with the male protagonist, is ultimately overwhelmed by the power of the Fomont colony. However, this dimension is hinted at subtly. The power of the poem lies in the voice of the narrator and the vividness with which her situation is described. Patterns of alliteration, assonance, repetition combine to convey a cloying sensuousness which mirrors the excess described. Read aloud, the reader can't help but be sensitised to the mouth and tongue. The rhyme, or the half-rhyme scheme of ABA, further increases the sense of claustrophobia in the poem. In these ways, the subject's physicality is enacted at the level of language. The ending of the poem is quite shocking and worth thinking about in terms of the poet's attitude towards consumption and where this might eventually lead. When you're looking at this poem, the other poems that you should consider in this collection are Caroline Duffy's poem, The Map Woman, as this could open up representations or discussions about the representations of the female body. The second poem in this collection is Chainsaw vs. the Pampas Grass by Simon Armitage. Now, Simon Armitage is one of UK's best known and loved poet. He was born in the village of Marsden and he lives in West Yorkshire. And until 1994, he worked as a probation officer in Greater Manchester, which is an interesting and very unconventional background for a poet. His prose work also includes two novels and a best selling memoir. He's received numerous awards, including being shortlisted five times for the T. Eliot Prize, the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year, the Keats Shelley Prize and the National Critics Circle Award in the USA. And he was also awarded a CBE in 2010 for his work in poetry. So now when it comes to the poem itself, The Chainsaw vs. The Pampas Grass. This poem is a real tour de force of physical description, with both the chainsaw and the pampas grass vividly personified. Patterns of imagery suggest a gender dimension to the confrontation. The adjectives used to describe the chainsaw and the way it operates are associated with traditional forms of male behaviour. In contrast, initially at least, the pampas grass is seen as decorative and passive. By the end of the poem, it's a seemingly fragile pampas grass that continues to flourish. The chainsaw, and by inference the narrator, is reduced to impotence. Moreover, the power dynamic between what is a man-made piece of machinery and a natural, albeit cultivated, plant implies a broader struggle that reaches beyond the borders of a suburban garden. This wider context is hinted at in the shift in language in the last two stanzas, which move beyond the earlier conversational circa 
tipping the balance towards a more lyrical tone, Daylight Moon, and also wider historical cultural considerations. For instance, Corn in Egypt and Count Back Across Time, which both feature in the poem. As with many Armitage poems, how far the narrator is an invented persona is interesting to consider. Stylistically, the poem is convincingly conversational with its mixture of long and short sentences, its relaxed line and standards are lengths, and its informal tone. Knocked back, gun the trigger, I left it at that. However, the poem is also highly patterned and a highly crafted piece of writing, which deploys rich imagery and extensive use of sound, including rhyme, alliteration and assonance, to convey emotional and physical aspects of the narrative. Now, when it comes to comparing this poem to other poems across the collection, when it comes to comparing this poem, you should think about other poems written in the first person, which can be instructive and provides ground for debates on how far the I of a poem can ever be identified the poet. This poem might sit somewhere between a more personal poem like Inheritance by Even Boland and Ian Duhigg's The Lammers Hireling, which is clearly spoken by a fictional narrator. The third poem in this collection is Material by Ross Berber. So Barber was born in Washington DC to British parents and she grew up in Essex, but moved to Brighton in the south coast of England at the age of 18. An academic poet and a novelist, she was well known as an expert on the Elizabethan poet and playwright Christopher Marlowe, the inspiration behind her verse novel The Marlowe Papers, which reimagines Marlowe as the pen behind the works of Shakespeare. She's also written three collections of poet, the most recent material being a Poetry Book Society recommendation. She's also a visiting research fellow at the University of Sussex, a lecturer in Goldsmith, and a director of research at the Shakespearean Authorship Trust. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, in this tightly rhymed poem, a single object, an old-fashioned lace hanky, becomes a way of invoking a varnished pre-decimal world of local shopkeepers, dance schools, and family-run department stores. With great economy and the use of vivid detail, the narrator of the poem takes us back to her childhood, and in particular, her relationship with her mother. This poem moves from this past into the present and a consideration of the narrator's own role as mother, and how this differs from the experience of earlier generations. The title has interesting resonance in the light of these generational concerns, referring both to the actual material the hankies are made of, so different from modern disposable tissues, and how we are shaped by our mothers and shape our children in turn. The phrase raw materials hovers behind the title, reminding us of the importance of nature in creating character. The poem is interestingly ambivalent about the lost world as symbolised by the hanky. The narrator recognises her own nostalgia for an era when community ties were stronger and mothers were stay-at-home homemakers with time for ironing and baking. But even back then, the poem implies she was impatient with the formalities represented by the hankies. For instance, the poem states, the naffest Christmas gift you'd get, and the social constraints of the period. It was a world with no room for individual creative expression where people, especially women and girls, had to step together, step together. However, contemporary motherhood is still hard to square with selfhood, requiring the compromise of television and shop-bought biscuits to get the time to write. The regular rhyme scheme of the poem, A, B, C, B, D, E, F, E, is suggestive of the more formal era the poet is evoking. It also suggests the constraints which the past still places on the narrator. Other poems we can compare material to are Caroline Duffy's Map Woman, which charts a similar kind of society, whilst also Inheritance by Even Boland reflects on this theme, though using a very different approach and tone. The fourth poem in this collection is Inheritance by Even Boland. Now, when it comes to Boland herself, she's an Irish woman, mother, poet, and exile, and she gave rise to, and or rather, Even Boland's um, mother gave rise to her own poetry. She's now recognised as one of the foremost voices in Irish literature. Boland was born in Dublin, Ireland on 24 September 1944, interestingly just a year before the end of the Second World War. Her father was a diplomat and her mother an expressionist painter. 
At the age of six, Boland and her family relocated to London, where she first encountered Irish anti-Irish sentiment. She later returned to Dublin for school and received her BA from Trinity College in 1966, and she's also educated in London and New York. Her early work is informed by experiences as a young wife and mother and her growing awareness of the troubled role of women in Irish society and culture. Irish myth and history have remained important sources of inspiration and her poems offer fresh perspectives on traditional themes. She's also the author of many books and essays as well as criticisms uh, featuring a variety of her work. She's also won numerous awards which are outlined here. Now, when it comes to the inheritance, the poet starts with the idea of wandering, which sets the tone for the poem's quiet, introverted quality. This is not a poem of dramatic gesture or noisy declamation. The informality of the poem's structure, the irregular stanzas, the relaxed sentences, contributes to the impression of someone thinking aloud. While the poem is ostensibly personal, there's a political and historical dimension in its focus on specifically female forms of inheritance. Prior to the Married Women's Property Act of 1870, a woman entering into a marriage in the UK had to give up ownership of her personal property, which was automatically transferred to her husband, who could choose to dispose of it as he wished. And of course, poor people, whether women or men, have always struggled to accumulate any kind of physical property to leave behind. Boland refers to just such a history of want, focusing instead on other kinds of inheritance, such as traditional craft skills and the anxieties of motherhood. The poem's moving closure acknowledges that, in the face of a child's illness, what connects her to, a mother, to mothers of previous generations is love, worry and powerlessness. The child gets better because the fever runs its course, not because she knows the secrets of health and air. When you're comparing this to other poems in the collection, one poem to think about is Seamus Haney's Out of the Bag, which makes an interesting contrast with Berlin's own poem. Both consider the effect of the past and the present, but the approach is very different, with Haney choosing to focus on a specific family memory while Boyland contemplates the past in more general terms. The other poem in this collection is A Leisure Centre is also a Temple of Learning by Susan by Sue Boyle. Now Sue Boyle lives in Bath where she organises the Bath Poetry Cafe and the associated cafe workshops and cafe writing days. Her work has also been published in several leading poetry magazines. And her collection, called Too Late for Love Hotel, was a winner in the 2009 Book and Pamphlet comp uh, competition. When it comes to the poem itself, this poem brings together the modern and the ancient. It combines the secular and the religious in a very surprising and witty way. The title itself encapsulates this lively dynamic describing a leisure centre as a temple in an unusual and an interesting, interestingly intriguing way. For the majority of the poem, the temple seems to belong to the young girl, who is both goddess and worshipper combined. Modern references, flexed and toned, chemicals, exfoliant, all which feature in the poem, give way to language reminiscent of the Old Testament's Songs of Songs or Song of Solomon. It's lavish, exotic and sensual. The girl is compared to all kinds of natural beauty, leopard, sand, willow, waterfall, listening bird, cream and raspberries are used in this description. This sense of exotic beauty is matched by her actions as she performs her elaborate cleansing ritual. In essence, the girl is worshipping her own body and its potential for love and sensual pleasure. The main tonal shift in this poem comes in the last three lines which are blunt in the warning about what happens next. Each line is end-stopped and stark in its effect. The focus shifts from an individual to a group of women who become the chorus. In Greek drama, the chorus form a single entity commenting on the dramatic action. They represent the general population of the particular story, in contrast to those characters taking centre stage, which tend to be famous heroes, kings, gods and goddesses. The world might, or rather the word, might also refer to the chorus of women or daughters of Jerusalem who appear in the Song of Songs as an audience or witness to the sensual love of the protagonist. Finally, these lines also point to post-Christian symbolism, the twelve women suggesting the twelve apostles, followed by Jesus. While the theme of youth and ageing might be a serious one, the pleasure the poem takes in the language used to describe the girl and the dark humour of its ending give the poem a light and enjoyable touch. Now, when you're considering other poems to link it to, 
From a, for a di very different take on the gap between youth and experience, have a look at Helen Donmo's To My Nine-Year-Old Self, where the relationships between observer and observed is more intimate. The other poem in this collection is History by John Burnside. So Burnside is the author of 13 collections of poetry, as well as novels, short stories and a memoir, receiving wide critical praise across all these genres. He was born in Scotland, however he moved away in 1965, returning to settle there in 1995. In the intervening period, he worked as a factory hand, a labourer, a gardener and for 10 years a computer systems designer. Burnside's central concerns have remained remarkably consistent across his work, though his manner of investigating them has evolved over time. Intensely lyrical in style, his poems engage deeply with questions of the self and our relationship with the natural world. His poems often blur the boundaries between the self and the other, and whether that's the spirit, the animal world, or the past. His poems are fraught with glimpsed presences, ghosts, angels, ancestors, and our own unlived lives. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, the dating of the poem sets the context. The immediate aftermath of the attacks of the Twin Towers in New York in 2001. This event, history with a capital H, casts a shadow over the whole poem. Though the poem is called history, it begins with the word today. Throughout the poem, the big events symbolised by the warplanes are set against the present moment. The beach, parents playing with their child, that child's absorption of the physical world. The poem suggests that paying attention to the world's transience and beauty might act as a kind of antidote to the hatreds that create ideologically motivated violence. However, the poem is not judgmental, acknowledging that our very presence in the world is a source of harm. The poem ends on the word irredeemable. In other words, that which is lost cannot be retrieved. The word also has a specific religious connotation. In the Christian tradition, Jesus is often referred to as Redeemer because he saved mankind from sin. Burnside is aware of these resonances, and his use of this word to close the poem is entirely fitting. It suggests that nothing described in the poem, natural or human, can ultimately be saved from history or time, but paying attention to the moment, as the poem does so beautifully, may at least bring us a deeper association, or rather a deeper appreciation, of all this gazed upon and cherished world. The poem enacts its themes through both structure and language. The first 22 lines are fractured, intent on recording sense impressions, details caught and recorded. The main verb is knelt, an action charged with spiritual meaning set in opposition to the threat of the war planes. The structure of the poem then shifts, the stanzas becoming intermittently more regular as observational detail turns to thought and an attempt to make some kind of sense out of what is happening in the world. The poem is balanced between a number of opposing concepts, which Burnside explores through complex strands of imagery. The setting of the beach is significant, poised between land and sea. Other opposites held in tension in the poem include the human and natural world, innocence versus guilt, pessimism versus hope, the earth, sea and air, freedom and captivity. Along with the line and stanza structure, these give the poem its sense of ebb and flow. When you're considering other poems in the collection to compare it to, consider Robert Mihinik's The Fox in the National Museum of Wales, which is a similarly expansive poem touching on some of the same themes. The contrast in tone could hardly be greater though, so these poems form an interesting pair to consider together, especially when thinking about which elements to combine to create the poet's distinctive voice. Another poem that follows in this anthology is The War Correspondent by Kieran Carson. Carson is from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and he's the son of Liam Carson, who's a postman. He acquired his taste for language and storytelling very early, and he recalls when he was two or three, his father would tell his children stories in Gaelic every evening, and each story would continu continue at least, it seemed that way, for weeks. Carson was educated at Queen's University in Belfast, from which he received a Bachelor of Arts degree in English, and from 1974 to 75, he worked as a school teacher in Belfast, after which he became the traditional arts officer for the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. His first volume of poetry was A New Estate, and he used 
And also what we'll find in a lot of his poetry is that he uses humour and satire in his work. And a lot of also his work reflects his Catholic upbringing, as well as the violent situation in Belfast, which includes the conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics. Longer lines of his earlier work, which are influenced by the American poet C.K. Williams, have gradually evolved, however, into a sparrow style through wordplay and an intense focus on language and form. His work has won many prizes and also he's published several novels, a memoir and translations. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, The War Correspondent, it actually consists of seven poems, all but one of which are set in the Crimea at the time of the Crimea War. This war took place between 1854 and 1856 and pitted a British and French alliance against Russia for their influence in the Near East. Gallipoli and Balaclava, two of the poems from the sequence, are named after two particularly infamous battles. Gallipoli is the one poem in the sequence not set during the Crimea War, but the First World War. It's about the Darnadels campaign of 1915 to 1916, a byword for military disaster, in which the Allied forces, Britain, the British Empire forces in France, attempted to secure Constantinople, which is modern-day Istanbul, from the Turks. The six-month campaign produced appalling casualties, almost half a million dead or wounded. Balaclava recalls a famous incident in the Crimean War known as the Charge of the Light Brigade, Due to a misunderstanding during this incident, a British cavalry charge was sent up a valley strongly held on three sides by the Russians. About 250 men were killed or wounded and over 400 horses lost for no military purpose. The British poet Alfred Lord Tennyson immortalised this battle in his verse in verse in The Charge of the Light Brigade, which is a poem. By juxtaposing two different conflicts 60 years apart, Carson makes a point about the world's ongoing addiction to war. The fact that in the First World War the great powers aligned themselves differently, with Russia now allied to Britain and France against the Turks and Germany, underlines the pointlessness of the earlier sacrifice. In Gallipoli, Carson presents a narrator trying to capture an impression of a place, teeming with uh, people and also chaotic in its environment. The crowdedness of the scene is enacted by the densely packed lines and stanzas which are full of rich sensory detail, conveying an overwhelming physicality. The place is a melting pot of races, of conflicting cultures and languages. The ethnic origins which Carson lists a roll call of European enmity over the past few years, a reminder of the ever-present threat of war. England and Ireland, Britain and France, Turks, Arabs and Armenians, Turks and Greeks, Muslims and Christians. The poem is also full of references to human activity of buying and selling, farming, trade, markets, factories, the arms industry, mining, drugs, sex, all reflect a world where everything is up for grabs, not least by the different empires whose rivalries were a key, key catalyst for the First World War. No wonder that in the last sign, the narrator acknowledges that he's still at a loss to describe Gallipoli. Balaclava ret- returns to the earlier conflict in Crimea, and describes an advance by Turkish and French troops, this time fighting on the same side. The living soldiers march over the ground where the charge of the Light Brigade took place, and the narrator describes in graphic detail the state of the graves of the dead English cavalrymen. The contrast between the living and the dead expressed vividly through the description of the uniforms under the hot sun, the gorgeousness of the Turkish and French uniforms versus the decay and degradation of the dead soldiers. However, the poem also suggests how quickly the living may turn into the dead. The scarlet trousers of the French cavalry are the same colour as the tatters of his slaughtered English counterpart. The point is underlined by the chilling details of the missing boots and buttons. The dead have been plundered by the living, whose lives may soon be lost. The other key strand of imagery in the poem is connected to the beauty of the meadow flowers. The soldiers in their colourful uniforms are like a bed of flowers, but they are a destructive presence, crushing the meadow as they march. The landscape has already been polluted by warfare, and the poem presents another tide of war, sweeping inexorably over this contested landscape. Other poems you can compare this to is John Burnside's poem History, which is also shadowed by war. Taken together, The poems form an interesting dialogue about the nature of war, both historical and contemporary. They're also concerned with evoking a sense of place, using contrasting techniques to do so. The next poem in this collection is An Easy Passage by Julia Copus. 
So Julia Copas grew up in London in a house with three brothers who were learning to play musical instruments. Two of them later went on to be professional musicians and Copas said in an interview that in order to have quiet in her room of her own, she gave up her own trumpet lessons and moved into a caravan in the driveway while she was doing her exam. She says, For the first time I truly began to feel that with the notepad and pen I could make my own world, could be whoever and wherever I wanted to be. Her poems are often subtly and elaborately structured when you consider them, and one of her achievements being the creation of new form in the spectacular or mirror poem, in which the second stanza repeats exactly the lines of the first, only in reverse. Her most recent collection contains a moving sequence, Ghost, which is the experience of IVF treatment. And she's an award-winning poet who's been shortlisted for several prizes, included here. Now when it comes to the poem itself, in the first line of this delicate poem, Copas uses the word halfway to describe the position of a girl as she prepares to surreptitiously clam back inside her own house, while her friend waits in the driveway below. This one word is suggestive of the poem's central concern, its exploration with that fleeting period between girlhood and womanhood. This poem of balance and poise contrasts, or rather aligns, with a girl's physical situation between up and down, indoors and outdoors, symbolising her stage in life. Throughout the poem, Copas uses opposites to create a sense of things being on the cusp. Sun is contrasted with shade, the freedom of young girls with the adult world of work, while the girl is described as being half in love with her friend. The use of tenses also informs the poem's structure. It's written in the past tense, but the reference to astrology and the presence of the older secretary, as well as the mention of the girl's mother, are reminders of what the future might hold in store. The sense of balance is further informed by the single question, which comes almost exactly halfway through the poem, in which the narrator, for only the, f- for the only time, comments directly on the action. While the narrator remains unobtrusive for most of the poem, her point of view is important. The scene is viewed through her eyes, as if through a movie camera, zooming in for close-ups on different characters and allowing us brief glimpses into their lives. While the tone is broadly conversational, the longish enjambed lines providing a naturally easy flow, there are subtle patterns of imagery which help bind the poem together. In particular, references to light and colour in describing the girls help to convey both the delicate physical presence and the fragility of this particular moment in time. Other poems you can compare it to in the collection are Helen Dunmore's To My Nine-Year-Old Self, Leonidas Flynn, The Furthest Distances of Travelled, explore similar territory in looking back at youth from an older perspective. They form an interesting contrast to the Copas poem though, as they both employ a more obviously personal voice in comparison to Copas's tender detachment. Deliverer by Titrani Doshi is another poem in this collection. And the poet, writer and dancer Tishani Doshi was born in the city formerly known as Madras, India, to West Welsh and Gujarati parents. She earned a BA from Queen's College in North Carolina and an MA from the Writing Seminars Department at John Hopkins University. And after working in the fashion magazine industry in London, Doshi returned to India. An unexpected meeting with one, Indi- one of India's dancers' leading choreographers led Doshi to a career in dance. And as well as performing as a dancer all over the world, she's a freelance journalist and has published five books of fiction, non-fiction and poetry. And she currently lives on the beach between two fishing villages in Tamil Nadu with her husband and three dogs. Now when it comes to the poem itself, The Deliverer, this uncompromising short sequence lays bare in the starkest language the infanticide of girl babies in India. While the language used is bored in the extreme, a troubling psychological depth is added by the complex relationships in the poem between the narrator, her mother, a foster child and the baby's new parents in America. These unspoken relationships call into question the nature of family bonds. Take the word sister in the first line, for instance, which refers to a nun, but hints at a lost relationship between the narrator and the foster baby. The use of the short sequence form enables the poet to explore this situation from different perspectives. It perhaps also suggests, in a shift from time and place, both the invisible global connections, rather, which link East and West, the developed and developing world, and the fracturing of family relationships. 
The lack of figurative or descriptive language combines or contributes to a flatness of tone, expressive of the bleakness of the situation. Single syllable verbs thud through the lines with a brutal emphasis on the physical. The potential of new life is reduced to something less than a body, to wood, bone and garbage. The one outburst of emotion, we couldn't stop crying, takes place in America. Back in India, the women who feel for penis or no penis cannot afford to confront their experience. The language returns to a kind of numbness as they go through the terrible motions of sex and birth. Grim though the events described are, the poem does not lay easy blame. The women who display such apparent heartlessness towards their girl babies are seen in the final part to be at the mercy of a society which privileges male children. We see them as victims too. Even the men they lie down for, the poem hints, are trapped by cultural and economic pressures. When you're considering other poems in the collection to compare it to, in its complex exploration of guilt and its use of stripped down language, Roderick Ford's Giuseppe is close in spirit to Doshi's poem. The next poem in this collection is The Map Woman by Caroline Duffy. Now when it comes to the poet herself, Caroline Duffy became the UK's first female poet laureate. Her poetry is both popular and critically acclaimed, and she's one of the most influential poets of recent decades. A prolific writer, she's, she's published eight poetry collections as well as plays and children's poetry, and she's edited several anthologies. She was born in Glasgow in 1955 to a Scottish father and an Irish mother. Raised Catholic, she grew up in Staffordshire, an ardent reader and an elder sister to four brothers. Duffy's mother would invent fairy tales for her, a form whose archetypes she's always found seductive. Encouraged to write from the age of 10 by an inspirational teacher at the common school that she went to, Duffy went on to study philosophy at Liverpool University, graduating in 1977, and she's won, won an array of prizes. So, when it comes to Duffy's own poetry, it's quite accessible and subtle, using conversational and colloquial language to great effect. She's a brilliant creator of voices, often using dramatic monologue to explore her themes. These include subverting female archetypes and challenging stereotypical gender roles, an empathy with the social outsider and the politics of language, and following the birth of her daughter Ella in 1995, motherhood. Duffy's poetry can be witty and toughly humorous, but also capable of lyrical beauty and great tenderness. She's also highly versatile, writing in a range of traditional forms, such as the sonnet for her book Rapture. So now when it comes to the poem itself, The Map Woman. The power of this poem partly lies in its combination of an impossible premise with detailed realism. The underlying metaphor, that we are indelibly marked by our own past, by our origins, is made literal by Duffy to disquieting effect. Throughout the poem, physical details pile up, bringing the woman's predicament vividly to life. Layers of imagery mirror the woman's different levels of self, working inwards through the course of the poem. It begins with clothing, which tries to hide the map, moves on to her skin and an exploration of geography and location, before ending beneath the skin with the disturbing image which turns the woman's body into earth, tunnelled and burrowed by the past. The relief of her new blank skin is short-lived, suggesting that the idea of starting again is an illusion because we carry our past inside us. <laughs> 
Cultural references such as the Beatles and the Picture House locate the past Duffy so effectively captures to the post-war era of the 50s and 60s. She creates a kind of English every town from that period, with its motorways and sensible shops and its strict social hierarchies, mayors, councillors, teachers. The poet uses geography to explore the social tensions and social expectations and assumptions of the time, neatly summarised by the list of English heroes after whom the more affluent streets are named. The poem hints that it's a society that's against which the woman chafed, the images of boundaries. The river, the motorway, the trees pining for big cities all suggest the series of constraint that the woman feels within the poem. The whole poem has a restlessness to which reflects a woman's attempts to escape her past. The prevalence of list gives the poems a galloping tempo, as does the predominantly anapistic rhythm. The poem's sense of barely contained energy is also conveyed through Duffy's extensive use of irregular rhyme and half rhyme. It's perhaps significant, then, that the poem ends on an almost couplet of bone and home, a sense of closure which, combined with the imagery, suggests the inescapable nature of the past. Other poems to compare it to, stylistically, is Simon Armitage's Chainsaw vs. The Pampas Grass, which has interesting similarities with Duffy's poem, and it could prompt an interesting discussion around how social expectations are experienced differently by men and women. Effects by Alan Jenkins provides a contrast in technique, exploring the same territory in a more realistic way. The Lama's Hireling by Ian Duhigg is the next poem in this collection. So Duhigg is the eighth of eleven children, born in London to Irish parents, with a liking for poetry. He worked for 15 years with homeless people and has subsequently held fellowships at Lancaster, Leeds, Durham and Newcastle universities. And he first came to prominence in 1987 when his poem 1919 won the National Poetry Competition, a feat he repeated with the Limus Hireling in 2000. And in 1994, he was named as one of Poetry Society's new generation of poets. Duhigg is particularly known for his inventive use of language and wide-ranging knowledge of world literatures, culture and history. This gives his poem incredible diversity and range. He often uses traditional forms, but in an unexpected way, while subversive whiff and irreverence is a hallmark of much of his work. He's also written libretti, music adaptations and a stage play written by various other authors too, and he currently lives in Leeds. So that when it comes to the poem itself, it's considered a contemporary classic, and the title of the poem is also the title of Duhigg's fourth collection, which won the National Poetry Competition in 2000. While the poem has a number of allusions and dialect words which require glossing, the best way to approach it is probably not to worry exactly what everything means, but to listen to the sound the poem makes and the atmosphere it creates. There's enough in the poem to provide a basic narrative before, before moving on to think about what is exactly going on and how this might be interpreted. Intentional ambiguity is one of the key features of this poem, so it's a good example to discuss when demonstrating that a poem isn't a code that can be broken to easily provide a single one-dimensional meaning. One way to interpret this is that this poem is a dramatic monologue telling the story of how the narrator, a farmer, came to hire a young man to help him with his cows. The title and the action of hiring a labourer at a fair takes us back to a rural world that dates back at least a hundred years, if not longer. It has echoes of a Thomas Hardy novel, and this archaic quality continues as the poem progresses. The new hired hand provides and enc proves uncannily good with the cattle. The poem states, yields doubled, and the cows only give birth to more valuable heifers. In his affinity with the beasts, he tends, the hireling, has almost a magical quality. All seems well until the ominous quote, then one night, at the end of the first stanza. The break generates tension, as we look to see what happens next. Suddenly, the narrator reveals that he is a widow. He dreams of his wife, wakes, and goes to see the hireling. In a nightmarish scene, the boy suddenly appears like a figure from witchcraft, naked, with a fox trap on his ankle, as if interrupted in the middle of a dark fright. The narrator knew him a warlock, that is, a male equivalent of a witch. Horrified, the narrator shoots him through the heart, 
By the light of the moon, he watches the body of the hireling transform itself into a hare, one of the most magical creatures in British folklore. His body grows lighter as the narrator takes him in a sack and dumps him in the river. Since the murder, the narrator's luck has run out, his cattle are cursed and he's haunted by guilt. He passes his time using the metal from coins to create a shot for his gun and in confessing his sins in all likelihood to a Catholic priest. While this summarises what happens to the poem, the motivations of the narrator, his exact relationship with the hireling and his relative guilt or innocence are all deeply ambiguous. The ending, with its direct plea, Bless me, Father, puts us in the role of the priest. But how are we to judge him when he isn't telling us the full story? In Catholic tradition, to be absolved of your sins, your confession needs to be full and made with a firm purpose of amendment. The narrator's confession is only partial, and maybe that's the reason that it has only been an hour since his last confession. He feels compelled to repeat his story again and again. We question, what is it the narrator isn't telling us? Perhaps he was sexually attracted to the hireling? The image of a cow with leather horns, as well as being an old description for a hare, combines the male and the female, as does the strange image of the narrator tracking down his wife's torn voice to the hireling's pale form. Is it the hireling's company he's so fond of, especially as he knew when to shut up? Does the narrator desire for the hireling surface in the world lovely? What, when it comes to it, happened to the wife? Was she really as dear to the narrator as we're led to believe? And is the narrator sound in mind, or has his subconscious, disturbed by his feelings, conjured up a demonic image of the hireling? This is all left very ambiguous, and we as readers are left to contemplate the answers to this ourselves. The poem deals with transgression, exploring the boundary between the real and the supernatural, the animal and the human, male and female, guilt and innocence, life and death, waking and sleeping, sanity and madness. The narrator uses the word disturbed at the start of the second stanza, and it's certainly the case that the poem itself has a disturbing power, the unreliability of its narrator drawing us back again and again, as is in the best ghost stories, to try and work out what actually happened. The shifts in mood are brilliantly underpinned by the sound and imagery of the poem, transformation and transgression taking place at the level of the individual words. Trace, for instance, the word light through the poem, how it starts out as an expression of cheer before becoming the light from the dark lantern by which he sees his vision of the naked hireling, before re-emerging as the queasy yellow light of the moon, which is witness to the murder and then finally transforming back to a reference to weight, this time associated with the hireling's dead body. Similarly, the literal, perhaps proverbial, heaviness of the narrator's person of her stanza has, by the end, become the weight of guilt and endless confession. Take also the vowel sounds in the poem and how they chime and shift as the poem progresses, the long I of light, for instance, or the dance between the pronouns I and him, which enact the central relationship of the poem that end in such violence. Add an alliteration and other sound echoes, and you have an incredibly densely woven poem, which nevertheless manages to retain its impression of a voice talking to us. When you're considering other poems to compare this poem to, there's several from the collection which also use a dramatic first-person narrator. We have Patience of Babi's poem, Dishani's Doshi's poem, and Roderick Ford's poems in particular. Consider the similarities and differences of approach in using this technique, which can be quite a useful exercise. The next poem in this collection is To My Nine-Year-Old Self by Helen Dunmore. Now, when it comes to Dunmore herself, she's an acclaimed poet and best-selling novelist whose work in both genres has won much praise and popularity. Born in Yorkshire, she's the second of four children and with a large extended family, Dunmore grew up surrounded by stories, fairy tales, ballads, and early grounding that would be very influential in her writing. Dunmore has also become a very acclaimed literary figure, winning many prizes. Her writing in both prose and poetry is known for its lyrical intensity, which can be both delicate and piercing. Her language is sensual and exact, recreating scenes for the reader that lodge in your mind. Many of her poems have the mysterious compressed quality of a short story, 
Her writing demonstrates more public concerns too, in particular threats to the natural environment and a fascination for history, as many of her novels are also set in the past. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, to my nine-year-old self, by using the form of a dialogue with her childhood self, Dunmore brings the process of growing older into sharp relief. She addresses directly the young girl she once was and, although her younger self doesn't speak, it is her physical presence which makes the most vivid impression on the reader. Her vitality and spontaneity are conveyed in a wealth of sensory detail. More than anything, the girl lives through her body, a string of active verbs demonstrating her energy and confidence. This contrasts with Dunmore's characterisation of her old self and the physical frailties she is now subject to. This physical contrast between the two is symbolic of the deeper attitudinal changes that Dunmore or the narrator have undergone. The girl's thinking, un or rather the girl's unthinking eagerness, has been replaced by a more fearful, pessimistic frame of mind which Dunmore is concerned will cloud the young girl's summer morning. However, the poem ends with a brilliant image of absorption in the world of the body and sensation which suggests that, even if this imagined internal dialogue could take place, the child would not be able to understand the adult's perspective. The shifting pronouns in the poem chart the sense of division between the child and the adult she will become. The unifying we keeps breaking down into I and you, culminating the statement in the last stanza, I leave you. It's impossible, the poem's ending suggests, for the two realities to coexist. Time inevitably cuts us off from our younger selves, even when, as in Dunmore's case, we can recreate the past briefly, poignantly, through language. Other poems to compare this to in the anthology, and which most obviously connect to Dunmore's, are Julius Copus's An Easy Passage. Also, looking at Burnside's evocation of childhood in history could be interesting as both writers use sensory impression to recreate the child's absorption in the physical world. The next poem in this anthology is A Minor Role by U.A. Fanthorpe. U.A. Fanthorpe's death in 2009 was felt as a genuine loss by many of the fans of her clear-eyed, humane prose, including Caroline Duffy, who described her as an official, deeply loved laureate. Fanthorpe spent her earliest years in Kent. She attended St Anne's College, Oxford, afterwards becoming a teacher and ultimately head of English at Cheltenham's Ladies' College. However, she only began writing when she turned her back on teaching to become a receptionist at a psychiatric hospital where her observation of the strange specialness of patients provided the inspiration for her first book called Side Effects. Following her relatively late start in literature, Fanthorpe was prolific, producing nine full-length collections, including the Forward Prize-nominated Safer's Houses and the Poetry Book Society Recommendation Consequences, and she was awarded a CBE in 2001. Talking of her wartime childhood, Fanthorpe said, I think it's important not to run away. And on the surface, her poetry seems to encapsulate those traditional, stoic English values we associate with that period. Certainly, England and Englishness are central themes in her work, but such a reading misses the wit and sly debunking of national myth which mark Fanthorpe's sensibility. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, at the core of this moving poem is a concern about how we speak truthfully in the face of life's most difficult moments. The metaphor of the stage and the narrator's minor role within a play is used to explore ideas of social pretense. In the face of serious illness, the narrator carries on acting. Fanthorpe establishes a dual perspective. Not only is the narrator an actor, but she's also a member of the audience watching as the action unfolds. Observed is a key word in the first line, implying distance and a sense of perspective, a stance the narrator retains up until the last line. The poem, though analysing the narrator's reluctance to acknowledge her illness head-on, suggests a wider refusal in society to look dying and death in the eye. These concerns are enacted through Fanthorpe's use of direct speech in the poem, alongside references to socially appropriate forms of language. For much of the poem, the narrator and the people around her deal in euphemism and false cheerfulness. Whilst these conventional exchanges help keep the monstrous fabric of daily life intact, they fail to communicate her predicament truthfully. 
There is an ambivalence in the poem, which is not entirely dismissive of the background mus- music of civility, but in the end, speaking personally and directly wins out in the power of that final line, set in its own to emphasise the importance and urgency of its message. The tension between truth-telling and evasion is also present in Fanthorpe's use of verbs. Much of the poem is written in the imperative. For example, it states, cancel things, tidy things, pretend all's well. The effect is of someone giving themselves a talking to, trying to keep a lid on emotion. The other predominant feature is Van Thorpe's use of the ing form, the suffix ing, for verbs, particularly in the second and third stanzas, which captures the endless, awful processes of being seriously ill, allowing no time for pause or reflection. Now, when it comes to linking this poem to other poems in the anthology, consider poems which talk about how to speak truthfully in the face of societal pressure, which is also a key theme of Adam Thorpe's moving poem about his mother on blindness, while Kieran O'Driscoll's poem Please Hold, although very different in tone, is also concerned with empty forms of language. The next poem in this anthology is The Gun by Vicky Fever. Vicky Fever grew up in Nottingham in a house of quarrelling women, an emotional inheritance which later finds expression in her poetry. Her dark and sensual reworkings of myth and fairy tale have been termed domestic gothic by fellow poet Matthew Sweeney. While her poems incorporate objects from everyday life, Fever often grafts them onto the transgressive power of these old tales, allowing her a space to explore emotions and desires which women are not usually allowed or don't allow themselves to express. A certain concern of her work is female creativity and its repression and how this can find an outlet in violence. Now when it comes to the poem itself, The Gun, the poem's audacious relish of the physical acknowledges the thrill of connection between sex, death and life. The opening stanza is dramatic, shocking even. A line, literal and metaphorical, has been crossed. The house is traditionally associated with life and family, a place where we feel safe. What enters into the sanctuary is a potential threat, however, a means of taking life. The atmosphere of violence is sustained throughout the poem, particularly in the sound of the language and the structure of the lines and stanzas. In the second stanza, for instance, short lines and disruptive line breaks combine with hard, consonantal sounds to give an angular, edgy feel to the description of the gun. It's as if the gun's explosive potential is embedded in the sound the poem makes. On Jean Beaumont, the running on of units of sense over two or more lines also has the effective effect of shining a small spotlight on those words at the end of the start of a line. The gun is full of such examples. For instance, a rabbit shot clean through the head or your hands reek of gun oil and entrails. You trample fur and feathers. In this way, the line breaks enact the violent encounter between the human and animal worlds. The poem also breaks contemporary literal taboos around hunting and the valuing of the natural world as well as gender roles. The narrator is seen as complicit in the gun's use but in a traditional female role, cooking what the man has brought her. By exploring the primitive thrill of hunting and its connection to our most basic instincts, Fever prepares the ground for the extraordinary last stanza. At this point, we move into a world of ancient rites and pagan beliefs with the appearance of the King of Death. The poem's contention that death brings life more starkly into focus is beautifully expressed in the last image of the king's mouth sprouting golden crocuses. Other poems you can connect this poem to is Patience at Bagby's Eat Me, which forms an interesting counterpoint to Fever's poem. It's also about appetite, but the gender roles play out differently, though the poems share a highly sensual approach to language. The next poem in this collection is The Furthest Instances of Travelled by Leonita Flynn. Sir Flynn is one of the most acclaimed poets in a new generation of Northern Irish writers. Her three collections to date have all won critical plaudits, and this obviously reveals how hard-hitting her writing is. Her work is also known for its quicksilver wit and irreverence. While a sophisticated writer steeped in literary traditions from Chaucer to Wordsworth to contemporary poets, her poems wear the learning lightly, even when dealing with darker subjects such as her father's Alzheimer's. She has also written articles, reviews and essays and is currently a writer in residence at the Bloomsbury Hotel in London.
Now, when it comes to her poem, journeys, physical and emotional, are at the heart of this lovely, rueful poem about growing up. It charts the shift from the freedom of a student traveller to the more mature perspective of the present-day narrator. In doing so, it acknowledges that our emotional geography is as significant to who we are as the physical journeys we undertake. Part of the poem's appeal lies in its honesty. The narrator's younger self thinks that she has the answer, stating, This is how to live. At the end of the poem, she's still on the move, though this time the distances travelled are through the lives of others. The narrator offers no conclusion about the best way to live. Life remains provisional, unsettled. While once this lack of stability represented freedom and adventure, now there's a sadness that things do constantly change, as well as nostalgia for the lost exhilaration of life on the open road. The names of remote places can draw up this lost excitement, but now moving on means leaving people behind. These memories might be throwaway, but they're also souvenirs and valentines. The poem's exploration of nature of freedom is reflected in Flynn's use of the rhyming couplet. However, instead of full rhyme, she often uses half rhyme. The line lengths do differ wildly. In the most extreme example, a word is split over two lines to clinch the rhyme. It's as if the poem is kicking against its own constraints, and this is partly what gives the poem its sense of over or freewheeling energy. The tone only shifts in the final stanza when the couplets finally settle into full rhyme with lines of similar length. Other poems to compare it to, for instance, for a different treatment on ageing and the shifts in perspective it brings, is Sue Boyle's A Leisure Centre is also a Temple of Learning, which makes for interesting comparison. The next poem is Giuseppe by Roderick Ford. So born in Swansea, Ford has lived a nomadic life, experiencing many different cultures which have informed his work. He was taken to Australia as an infant. Then, when he was eight, his parents moved to England. Growing up in the 60s, he embraced the counterculture of the time, living and working around the world, including West Africa and the Persian Gulf. After spending most of the 1980s in Bristol, he moved to Paris, which marked a shift away from experimental prose works, which have been his creative focus to a life dedicated to reading, studying and using poetry. Using Paris as a base, he travelled to Europe and lived for long periods in Amsterdam, Venice, Stockholm and Cervazzo, a wooded island on the Baltic. And these engagements with different cultures have informed and deepened his poetry. He currently lives in Dublin and he's won a range of prizes which are outlined here. Now when it comes to the poem itself, Giuseppe. This is a really disturbing poem, which blends historical realism with the fairy tale element to explore the darkest corners of human behaviour. The airy effect of the poem is partly achieved through the contrast between what happens and the tone in which it's described. The language is deliberately flat and factual, concentrating on actions without comments. Even a word like butchered, which we might expect to carry a moral judgement, is revealed as being an accurate description of the mermaid's dismemberment. Figurative language is almost entirely absent. There are only two adjectives, golden and large, and one simile. But she screamed like a woman in terrible fear. This one simile has tremendous power, however, going to the heart of the poem, which is what makes us human. Under the pressure of war, we, que we question whether there's any innate moral compass that can keep us on the right side of horror. In this context, the mermaid can be said to be symbolic of any outsider or enemy. By making her a creature from legend, Ford allows us to look more clearly at the protagonist's behaviour. Their strategy is to deny her any humanity. The talk of proof, using her physical difference and supposed mental incapacity as an excuse for what they do. In this, they recall the arguments set forth by the Nazi regime and other totalitarian authorities throughout history, bent on establishing racial superiority. However, the poem undermines the key arguments at key points, and demonstrates the perpetrators are lying to themselves. The doctor won't eat the row offered to him. Most disturbing is the re revelation that she was married, that she crossed into the human world of love and might have expected protection from arm. No one can quite bring themselves to remove her wedding ring, despite the desecration of her body. What the poem demonstrates succinctly is the lasting effect of atrocity on a community, for this is an event in which the entire village is implicated. While the violence carried out by key members of the community, most disturbingly perhaps the doctor, no one else, including the narrator's uncle, tried to intervene. 
This collective guilt, the poem implies, is seeping into the next generation. We can sense it in the compulsion of the narrator to tell his uncle's story and the inability to look each other in the eye. The poem ends on the word God, reminding us of how far the protagonists have moved outside moral boundaries. In its deliberateness and its deliberate flatness of tone in dealing with atrocity, when you're considering which other poems to link it to, this poem is quite similar to the strategy used by Tishani Doshi in her sequence The Deliverer, while the ambiguity of Ford's narrator could also be interestingly compared with the narrator of Du Higgs' The Lama's Hireling. The next poem to consider is Out of the Bag by Seamus Heaney. Sahini so rose from humble beginnings as a country dairy farm boy to become one of the giants of the 20th century of poetry. He's the one winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1995 and his work is known and loved around the world. His poetry is informed by his wide learning and knowledge of literature, but never overwhelmed by it. Rather, he roots his work in the specific, alert to the miracles of ordinary beginnings. Allied to a rich music of consonant and rhythm, influenced by cadences of his Northern Irish accent, these qualities mean his poetry appeals as much to reader and the heart as to the mind. It's perhaps these aspects of his work which have made him a genuinely popular poet, one of the few that people beyond poetry world have heard of. The contentious history of Northern Ireland and its eruption into the Troubles has also influenced Haney's work. That he refused a simple stance of pro-Republican propaganda, his poetry insisting on the complex realities of the situation. This refusal to become a cheerleader for the Catholic cause drew criticism from some quarters of the time and partly prompted his later move over the border to the Republic of Ireland. Gradually, however, the integrity of his vision won recognition culminating in his noble citation, which praised his work for its lyrical beauty and ethical death. Haney died in 2013. Now when it comes to the poem itself, in this sequence, Haney blends personal memory with his deep knowledge of the classical world of ancient Greece to interrogate myths of origin. The poem itself acts like a bag, its contents slowly revealed to the poet. The movement of the poem from the Haney household to the Catholic shrine at Lourdes, to the Greek archaeological site at Epidaurus, and then back to the room where his mother gave birth, gives it a sense of closure. The poem travels demonstrate how far the poet has come from his start in life and how important the start remains in his psyche and poetic practice. Through its different registers of language and imagery, the poem also explores ideas of class, faith and gender. Central to these concerns is the remarkable figure of Dr. Curlin. He's part of Haney's childhood mythology, in which each new baby in his family was brought by the doctor in his bag. It's a story that the adults collude in and the children believe. It turns the doctor, already their superior in terms of wealth, education and social status, into something approaching a god. He's treated with reverence, each visit accompanied by time-honoured rituals. The first poem ends with Haney's childhood self-imagining a glimpse into the realm where the Doctor lives, a frightening place which demonstrates his power over life and death. In the second and third poems, Haney's later perspective as a highly educated poet takes over. He self-consciously displays his classical learning by going back to the origins of medicine and the cult of the Greek god of healing, Asclepius. However, despite his knowledge, Haney also presents himself as essentially powerless. At Lord's, he was merely the priest's helper at the Catholic service, nearly fainting in the heat, a reaction he suffers from again, as he bends to pick some grass from the grounds of the Greek temple. All he can do in the face of the illness of friends is to send them tokens from the god's side and lie down hoping his goddess daughter will appear. By contrast, the vision of Dr. Curlin is one again full of decisive energy and a godlike power. The phrase Poeta Doctus reveals some of the ambivalence in the poem. While Haney has achieved the status of a poet who is also versed in classical learning, the phrase also leads us to question the power of poetry in the face of suffering. We question whether poetry can affect any kind of cure or if it's just another form of superstition, a matter of faith. In the final poem, Haney is once again the passive observer, allowed into the inner shrine of his mother's bedroom. Movingly, the mystery Haney reveals at the heart is of given life is not a goddess, but his mother. 
The poem acknowledges his mother's power, but the poignancy lies in the fact that she doesn't feel able to claim the triumph of giving birth for herself. The social constraints of the time, the taboo talk against talking about the female body, the deference of the working class to the educated class, mean she doesn't take any credit. Her voice at the end, with its sweet colloquial tone, contrasts with Haney's erudition and acts as a final dramatisation of the tensions which run throughout the poem. Other poems you can compare it to is Ruth Padel's You, Shiva and My Mum, which looks at motherhood, faith and culture. The other poem to compare is Effects by Alan Jenkins. Now, Jenkins was born in Surrey in 1955 and brought up in London, where he has lived for most of his life. He has a large body of work which spans his works beginning with his poetry collections in 1988 all the way through to 2015 and also his award in 2006. Jenkins has said that one of his poetic elders and betters once told him, your subject is loss, stay with that. And the treatment of loss appears as a significant theme throughout his work. In earlier collections, the loss was focused on love, particularly the painful central sequence of his book, Harm, about the aftermath of a love affair. Later work has included many elegies for friends and parents. Known for their confessional tone, Jenkins' poems are also formally brilliant, his scrupulous structures and sharp wit helping to shape the intense emotions he lays bare. Now when it comes to the poem itself, the first action of the poem, the narrator holding his dead mother's hand, releases a flood of memory, a rich poignant vein of recollection that recreates a life from which has just come to an end. The poem's syntax is central to its impact. Written on one long block of text containing only two sentences, it suggests an unstoppable flow of thought and feeling. The poem unfolds through a complex structure of clauses and subclauses. Each new detail the narrator notices about his mother's hand triggers further memories. The life remembered though, or rather through the hand, is typical of the mother's class and era. It's conservative with a small c, limited in terms of education and experience, a life lived at a time when foreign holidays were beyond the reach of ordinary people, food meant plain, English dish dishes, and a woman's place was in the home. By contrast, the narrator, or her son, is educated and this has opened up a physical and emotional distance between him and his mother that her death has now made painfully permanent. The poem's power lies partly in the narrator's sense of regret for the judgmental attitude of his younger self, impatient with the limitations of his back parents and background. Too late, he's come to understand that his antipathy towards her reflects a lack of compassion. It's only now she's dead that he finally holds her hand when it can no longer provide any comfort. The closing image of the small bag of effects is a touching indication of how little she has to leave behind. The poem is tightly but irregularly rhymed, with some rhymes occurring as much as 14 lines apart, while couplets are also scattered throughout the poem. This oscillation between closeness and distance mirrors the nature of the central relationship. The pattern changes towards the end of the poem with the rhymes becoming denser and more frequent until we reach the three rhymed lines at the end. In this shift, it's possible to discern, perhaps, the narrator's growing sense of the reality and finality of his mother's death. Other poems to compare it to are Complexities of Class and Inheritance, which are explored in Ross Barber's material, which also focuses on the narrator's relationship with her mother. Hands are also the central image of Sinead Morrissey's Genetics, a poem very different in tone and form. The next poem in this anthology is The Fox in the National Museum of Wales by Robert Mihinik. So he's described as the leading Welsh poet of his generation, and he's a novelist, essayist, and leading environmentalist. His passion and concern for the environment runs through much of his literary output. His book, Watching the Fire Eater, combines environmental and literary interests, and it was named Welsh Book of the Year in 1993 a feat which he repeated in 2006 with To Babel and Back, which, among other things, researched the use of depleted uranium in modern weapons, following a deadly trail from the uranium mines of the USA to Saddam Hussein, uh, Iraq. <laughs> 
The recent Iraq wars also feature in his poetry, with his poem 25 Laments for Iraq winning the Ford Prize for the best single poem. And these political and environmental concerns are married in his poetry to lyrical narrative dense with imagery. Robert Mihinik lives in South Wales, and his debut novel, Sea Holly, was published in 2007 and shortlisted for the 2008 prize. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, in his tour de force of a poem, the poet creates in the figure of the fox an ambiguous guide to the culture housed in the museum. On the one hand, he's a vivid presence, the essence of the living animal. The verbs used to describe him convey his physical energy. He doesn't stop. He skedaddles, shimmies and trots. However, the fox also has a symbolic quality to him, drawing on his place in folklore. This element is less benign, recalling to mind the fox's cruelty and cunning as a predator. That the narrator sees him as a threat is clear from his pursuit through the museum and his repeated cry, the fox is in the flock. This is underlined by the image of the blood on the bristles around his mouth. As the narrator chases the fox through the poem, we're taken on a whistle-stop tour of human history. While the title refers to the National Museum of Wales, the cultures represented in it range across the world, from the dynasties of China to India, to the ancient civilization of the Sumerians, now part of modern-day Iraq, to Wales's own distant Celtic and more recent industrial past. In doing so, the poem suggests, perhaps, that a single nationality never exists in isolation, but is always connected in complex ways to the wider world. A similar point is made by the range of disciplines represented. There's art, which is modern and contemporary, archaeology, industrial and social history, science and natural history, the full range of human endeavour. So what are we to make of the threat that the fox poses? One possible interpretation is that the fox, as the poem itself states at one point, is the future. This is what makes him something to follow, and why the narrator can never catch up with him. If that's the case, we can question what kind of future might the fox represent. The last line of the poem suggests a dark conclusion, iron doors closing in on human history. This undertow of darkness is borne out in images of extinction. Those once powerful civilizations mentioned in the poem are long gone, as dead as the proverbial dodo referenced in stanza 5. In addition, there are hints of the kind of environmental trouble we are storing up for ourselves. The use of oil drum and bubble wrap to describe specimens in the natural history section, the reference to Brugmansia, a plant now extinct in the wild, and the beautiful metaphor Cornfield Sigh to describe the effects of engineering. All these suggest a future where the very idea of civilization may be threatened, undermining the title's pride in the concept of a national museum. The overall effect of this poem, however, is far from downbeat. The sheer vitality of the fox and the language used to describe him defies the logic of the poem's conclusion. The heavy use of alliteration in particular gives the poem a driving momentum. We may be approaching the end game rapidly, but there's still the sheer pleasure of the sound and movement to enjoy on the way. This ambiguity is expressed in the contents of the museum itself, which epitomise both humanity's destructive and creative impulses. Now, when it comes to comparing other poems with this poem, we should consider how national is treated irreverent, or rather national identity, is treated irreverently in Dalgit Nagra's Look We Have Coming to Dover. As whilst the two poems sh- share a kind of manic energy in the sound they make, they are quite different. Another poem to consider as well is The War Correspondent by Kieran Carson, which makes for an interesting comparison, as both poems are ambitious in their attempts to use a huge sweep of human history to hint at contemporary issues. The next poem is Genetics by Sinead Morrissey. Morrissey grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and was made the city's inaugural poet laureate in 2013. She was educated at Trinity College Dublin, and she's travelled quite widely and lived in Japan and New Zealand, experiences that have left a mark on her early poetry. And her work is quite wide-ranging in its subject matters. However, her poems are beautifully controlled with literary sophistication, which does not preclude tenderness. Her poems encompass historical imaginings and domestic scenes and are appreciative of worldwide cultures while always being firmly rooted in Northern Ireland. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, Morrissey's choice of the villanelle expresses beautifully the dance of separation and togetherness which runs through the poem. 
A villanelle requires two repeated lines which alternate at the end of each stanza, and the whole poem is constructed from only two rhymes. The parents' relationship with each other and the child is beautifully expressed by this structure, form and meaning in the poem becoming one. The interlacing of words and rhymes suggests a complex inheritance of genetics is revealed in the narrator's hands. The villanelle is also a circular form, coming back in the final couplet to where it began. It forms a ring echoing the imagery of marriage in the poem. However, Morris's use of the form is even more subtle. Just as genetics don't result in a carbon copy of the previous generation, so the rhymes and repetitions in the poem aren't exact. The key rhyme, out of which the rest of the poem grows, is palms, hands, a half not full rhyme. The words echo each other, as do the words mother and father. They touch both meaning and in sound, but they are not the same. The narrator has inherited physical likeness from both parents, but these combine to create a new individual identity. The fact that the parents are no longer together makes the presence in the narrator's body all the more literally touching. The Christian marriage ceremony speaks of the couple becoming one flesh, how the narrator's hands now are all that are left of that commitment to each other. The last stanza introduces another relationship to the poem. A you is suddenly addressed as the narrator looks to her own future and the possibility of having a family of her own. So while the poem does return to its start, it also makes a fresh chapter. Continuity and change are again brought together. Poems to link this to are Inheritance by Even Boland, which is a very obvious poem to look at, alongside genetics in the subject matter, while George Sertz's song also demonstrates the musical power of highly patterned poetry and how small modulations can carry the meaning of a poem. The next poem in this anthology is From the Journal of a Disappointed Man by Andrew Motion. Now, when it comes to Motion himself, he was born in London but he grew up in rural Essex, a background which gave him an abiding love for the English countryside. These early years were formative in other ways. He was introduced to poetry by a supportive school teacher, while the early loss of his mother through a riding accident shows much through his work. He read English at University College Oxford, where he was taught by W. H. Auden, and he went on to teach English at the University of Hull, where he met the poet Philip Larkin, who was another abiding influence. When it comes to his poetry, It's characterised by an interest in narrative and an understated meditative style, which links him to an English tradition that can be traced through Edward Thomas, Thomas Hardy and back to Wordsworth. He often uses fictionalised narrators and historical events to explore his themes. While possessing accessible clarity, his poems are powerful for what they omit as much as for what they contain, suggesting undercurrents of emotion that his narrators are either aware of or unwilling to disclose. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, the key to this poem lies in the contrast between the narrator and the workman that he's observing. Throughout the poem, there's little or no interaction between observer and observed. The poem does not comment on but dramatises the distance between the two. One obvious contrast is the physical strength and activity of the workman as opposed to the passivity of the narrator or observer, a difference compounded by the use of language. The title of the poem, with this learned tone recalling works of fiction from the 18th and 19th century, suggests the narrator is a man who understands literary heritage. He's a man of letters, whose own language is full of long words and complex references, very different from the silent workmen who, when they speak, do so with functional simplicity. Though it purports to be a journal entry, the poem offers very little by way of insight into the thoughts and emotions of the narrator. His feelings about the workmen are only hinted at in the metaphors he chooses to describe them. These are the only figurative language in the poem, and suggests an ambivalent attitude, monsters, mystic, original thinker and majesty. Through this juxtaposition, the poem seems to offer the reader two alternative versions of masculinity. However, by the end of the poem, it seems that neither kind of man has an answer to the secret problem. The old Soviet-era heroism that might once have attached to this scene of the working man dissipates into listlessness. They are engaged in a hopeless task which defeats them and leaves them just as much observers as the narrator. The final image of the pile hanging uselessly in midair seems symbolic of the whole enterprise, the narrator tacitly acknowledging that he too is a spare part. The task they engaged in, which is repairing a pair, might have further symbolic significance. Piers are structures that literally don't go anywhere. They're also remnants of the Victorian and Edwardian eras, a period of remarkable feats of engineering expressive of broader confidence and progress. By contrast, neither the workmen nor the narrator are able to offer a way forward. 
This takes us back to the disappointment of which the title applies in different ways to both sets of men. When considering other poems to link this to, in its concern with contemporary masculinity and its sense of defeat, Motion's poem has an interesting parallel to Simon Armitage's Chainsaw vs. the Pampas Grass, as both poems have narrators whose exact relationship to the poet is blurred, and they are not clear-cut traumatic monologues, but in the evasion and the ambiguities of the voice, they imply a constructed character. The next poem in this collection is Look We Have Coming to Dover by Daljit Nagra. Nagra was the first poet to win the Ford Prize for both his first collection of poetry and for its title of the poem Look We Have Coming to Dover three years earlier. A lot of his work has been shortlisted and it's really interesting to consider that his most recent and third collection is a retelling of an ancient Indian myth about Rama's quest to recover his wife Sita from her adoption by Ravana, the lord of the underworld, this collection being called Ramayana. He was born and raised in West London and then Sheffield, and he currently lives in Harrow with his wife and daughters. A lot of his work is driven by the energies of the cultural clash between his Punjabi immigrant background, as well as his English lived experiences, as well as his citizenship. He's concerned with Britishness and Asianness, especially the points where these two conditions collide. And while his poems deal with serious issues, including the racism he experienced growing up in England, his poems are characteristically upbeat, charming and humorous, with a formal dexterity and inventiveness in his language. Now when it comes to the poem, look we have come into Dover. The poem's title alerts us to the concepts of England and Englishness, which are gleefully dismantled in the rest of the poem. The title itself is grammatically incorrect, and it sets the context of a speaker for whom English is a second language. The mention of Dover, one of the entry points in the UK for immigrants, legal and illegal, provides a further clue as to the narrative voice. Dover is also deeply resonant as an English location. Its famous white cliffs, a cultural shorthand for the country's history as an island power. It also has a powerful literary heritage, as the epigraph reminds us. Matthew Arnold's On Dover Beach is a famous poem written in 1851, which expresses society's growing anxiety about the modern secular world. Nagra's poem also echoes Arnold's in the implied presence of a beloved to whom the poem is addressed. In contrast to Arnold's poem, however, the title's exclamation mark is expressive of an energetic optimism which sets the tone for what follows. The story in this voice discloses one of hardship and poverty. In comparison to the cushy tourists, the narrator and his kind have very little power, economic or otherwise. The huddled, hatched, burdened, grafting, out of sight and mind. But despite this, the narrator can imagine a future where they've won the way to prosperity. The poem ends where it began with a reference to the Arnold poem. A mythical England is symbolised by the white chalk of the Dover Cliffs and an exclamation mark. The tone and energy of the poem is bound up in its language. Each stanza is packed with a dizzying array of sound effects, rhyme, half rhyme, alliteration and assonance. Coupled with this is an infectious irreverence towards proper English. Nagra coins new verbs such as flemmed, unbladders, passport us and blared. These he mixes with phrases from colloquial English such as gobfuls, scramming, hoik and linguos to form a lively hybrid which mirrors the mixing of cultures that immigration entails. The effect is fun and funny, both at the expanse of the English and also, to an extent, the expense of the narrator, whose dreams of a new life are a parody of aspiration. The poem also incorporates language often used by those who see immigration as a threat to national identity. It uses words like invade, teamed, swarms, and it subverts it by putting it in the mouth of an immigrant, in this case a Punjabi Indian. Through this cheerful disregard of standard or correct English and subversion of the tabloid discourse on immigration, Nagra puts the issue of what constitutes national identity at the heart of this poem. The place and its language are in effect one and the same, which gives the narrator's remaking of the letter a satirical and political edge. Now when considering other poems to compare this to, the multicultural complexities of Nagra's poem are also echoed in Ruth Padel's You, Shiva and My Mom. For another example of how humour can explore th- serious themes, consider Kieran Odishkol's Please Hold, which makes for an interesting comparison. The next poem is Fantasia on a theme of James Wright by Sean O'Brien. So O'Brien has been described as a leading poet, editor and critic of his generation. He was born in London, but grew up in Hull, the North East. Its landscapes, history and culture have remained a core influence and concern in his work. 
He has several poetry collections which indoor, include The Indoor Park, which is the winner of the Somerset Morgan Award, The Frighteners, Ghost Train, and the publication of The Drowned Book. He's also achieved the unique feat of winning the Forward Poetry Prize of the Best Collection for the Year and the only poet to have won this prize, and he's also won several other prizes. When it comes to his writing, his imaginative landscape remains rooted in its own version of the North, from the bomb streets of Hull to the economic deprivations of his adopted city, Newcastle. It's a world of hidden gardens, railway lines, estuaries, industry and decline, a territory he's made his own, exploring it with an increasingly intense, dreamlike quality. Combining literariness with colloquial language, O'Brien's work can be angrily satirical but also ruefully humorous in its treatment of its abiding themes of history, politics and class. Now when it comes to the poem itself, Britain's industrial past, specifically the life and culture of its miners, is hauntingly evoked. The title of the poem references a great American poet, James Wright, whose work often defended the disenfranchised. O'Brien's poem also takes a similar approach to the miners, commemorating the lost way of life. The poem locates the miners and the past they represent underground where they once laboured and where they have now become like ghosts in a very British version of the classical underworld. They're seen as passing into history. The poem states, we hardly hear of them. In the face of this oblivion, O'Brien's miners are characterised by the gritty stubbornness. The carrion working refusing to believe that history is done. Their memory has gone underground where they've become at one with the bedrock they used to dig. The narrator, however, does not have a raised tinted attitude towards the past. They're not nostalgic. There's an implied criticism of the miners' determination to go down in good order and the loyalty to a class which clung to its privations as a badge of honour. However, the last two stanzas express a deep respect for the miners and acknowledgement of kinship with them in moving the, in the moving use rather of the word brothers. The language of the poem is a solemn is solemn with biblical resonance to this imagery. The miners are identified throughout with the founding elements of stone and water, an imagery which imparts a sense of grandeur. This is matched by the sound of the poem. While written as free verse, it's nevertheless heavily patterned, giving it a formal quality appropriate to its elegiac tone. Pairs or triplets of alliterating, strongly stressed words generate a powerful rhythm, expressive of the heavy work that the miners carried out. The second, third and fourth stanzas in particular use this effect to convey a powerful sense of the miners' physical presence. While on the one hand, the poem seems to accept that the miners are consigned to history by associating them with the fundamentals of life, O'Brien also suggests that the power is not entirely spent. Singing, friction and rush all speak of a presence which retains a collective energy that may, one day, disturb the future. The seam of the past may not be entirely exhausted. Other poems to compare it to or to link it to are... Andrew Notion's poem from the Journal of the Disappointed Man, which has a very different take on the industrial past and its deliberately cool tone contrasts with O'Brien's biblical cadences. The next poem is Please Hold by Kieran O'Driscoll. And he is an Irish poet whose work blends dark humour and lyrical craft. His early influences were classical modernists of the 20th century, including T.S. Eliot and St. John's Purse. However, over time, O'Driscoll found their purity of style in a bleak manner, increasingly at odds with what he wanted to express, particularly his anger at political folly and social injustice. Hence, he's turned to satire in his work as an alternative, and this has enabled him to create a new poetic voice for which he's best known. He now lives in Limerick, the Republic of Ireland. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, in his infuriating experience of an automated telephone system, O'Driscoll finds a deeper metaphor for modern life. He's trapped in a world of binary response where any deviation from the set script is met with an incomprehensional delay. In his use of repetition, O'Driscoll creates a horrible made of a horrible maze of language full of wrong turns and dead ends. Language is reduced to a banality bordering on the meaninglessness. It's become purely operational with no room for anomaly or shades of meaning. The irony is that, should the narrator manage to bypass the system and get through to a real person, they'll treat him in just as robotic a fashion. The poem has a kind of desperate comedy about it. It's funny, but with a darker undertone, partly due to the repeated insistence that, 
this is the future. Whether by that it's meant the dominance of automation in our daily lives, the failure of language to communicate what we need or the confusions of old age or all of the above isn't made explicit. However, it's clear the narrator takes a dim view of the future if this is what it means. This view is made increasingly clear by the narrator's internal translator who starts to present alternative sarcastic meanings to the phrases offered by the automated voice. The mention of looting also brings in the outside world briefly, hinting that the narrator's impotence in the face of this system has this parallel in how access to money and power is tightly controlled at a societal level. The deeper implications of this incident are borne out in the final three lines set apart from the rest of the text. Their progression from hold to old to cold is a powerful warning that a whole life might pass by while you wait for the answer you need. So most of the other poems in this selection deal with the past, both historical and personal. This poem is interesting in that it has one foot in the future, as does Robert Mihinik's The Fox in the National Museum of Wales. So this is a really good poem you can compare it to. This is because both poems use humour, but while in Mihinik's poem language is still a vital and creative aspect, O'Driscoll explores what happens when language is emptied of these qualities. The next poem in this collection is You, Shiva and My Mum by Ruth Padell. So Padell is an award-winning British poet, writer and poetry fellow at King's College London. And born in London, she began her, her academic and literary career as a classicist, studying for a PhD on Greek tragedy at Oxford University, where she also taught. She has an, a range of poetry collections which have been published and been outlined here. And her latest collection is called Learning to Make an Oud in Nazareth, published in 2014. Her work has a bold energy, combining consumerism, popular culture and classical references. And animals are also an abiding source of inspiration and imagery in her richly sensuous poems. Now when it comes to the poem itself, You, Shiva and My Mum, while the main body of this poem affectionately brings to life the character of the narrator's mother, a large part of the powers, or rather the poem's power, is generated by its use of a question to frame the narrative. The poem asks, should I tell how? Of course, in the process of asking this question, the story is told, so the question may be said to be rhetorical, with the last stanza acting as confirmation that the story is worth telling. However, this framing device does raise interesting issues. It suggests, firstly, that the narrator is unsure as to whether to tell the story or not. Why might this be the case? Is she worried about embarrassing her mother? Or whether her mother might be accused of hypocrisy for embracing traditional Indian wedding customs, even though she's a non-believer? We perhaps question whether the narrator is concerned that the story will reveal too much about her heritage or that the you of the title might disprove. All these possible anxieties are set in train by the questioning structure of the poem and the bubble away under the surface. Some of these anxieties are also expressed in the shifting perspectives of the poem, as introduced by the title. The poem is unsure of where to stand, like the mother has one foot in contemporary Western culture, and one foot in traditional Indian culture. In addition, there's a narrator's relationship with her mother on the one hand and the relationship with you on the other. This seesawing is emphasised by the poet's use of indented stanzas, the poem's actual appearance on the page suggesting the shifting ground of its subject matter. Eight out of the twelve stanzas are also enjambed, the unit of sense breaking across stanzas to disorienting effect, while the irregular light touch rhymes and half rhymes of the poem bind it together but not too tightly. Connection and disconnection are therefore felt at a structural as well as thematic level. What's achieved by the end is a kind of balance. The fond laughter of the you and the final statement at the end are reassuring. It's okay to be in both worlds. The narrator finds inspiration in the physical and mental indomitability of her 80 year old mother. Her willingness to face physical hardship and to enter into a ritual, despite reservations for the sake of her son and his new wife, is ultimately seen as a good compromise. Tribal, Hindu, atheist and Christian loyalties are brought into fellowship with each other through the wedding ceremony and her mother's role in it. And when you're considering other poems to compare to, Look We Have Come Into Dover is an interesting and good comparative poem as it explores cultural diversity, though in Padel's poem the journey is inverted with a return to rather than a journey from the current era of origin. The next poem to consider is Song by George Sertz. So he came to England in 1956 as a refugee from Hungary following the Hungarian uprising in Eastern Europe. 
He was educated in England and has always written in English. At the heart of his work is the dual perspective of an exile. In his work, English individualism and Eastern European influences meet, creating fascinating tensions. A return trip to his native Bud Budapest in 1984 proved a particularly fruitful trigger for his creativity. This city has always been a haunting presence in his poetry, a result of displacement and the consequent negotiation between a European sensibility and English culture. The past is deeply ambiguous, vulnerable to the resurrection of memory. Myth and fairy tale rub shoulders with ordinary details from English life, while the malign presence of history and totalitarian politics hovers at the edges. These ambiguities and complexities are held in place by a rigorous and ambitious use of form. Terza, Rhyme and the Sonnet are favourites, and Sertz has commented on the importance of him, to him of Rhyme, describing it as an unexpected salvation, the paper nurse that somehow, against all the odds, helps us stick the world together, while all the time drawing attention to its own fabricated nature. Now when it comes to the poem itself, the poem celebrates small actions which cumulatively can make a difference. It's dedicated to the South African white liberal activist Helen Sussman, who campaigned all her adult life against the apartheid system. This is the context for a poem which honours a collective power of protest. As the title suggests, pattern of sound, particularly rhyme and repetition, are central to the poem's effect. The poem is split into three sections which mirror the basic chorus verse chorus structure of a song. The central two stanzas develop and comment on what's pre presented in the first and third sections. The poem insists that a single voice or hand, when joined with others, can bring to effect change. The idea is explored through opposing images of heaviness and lightness, the feather that can tip the balance of a sinking ship followed by the repetition of the word weight four times. The sense of shift is also present in the short, largely enjambed lines, which provide a momentary hiatus as the eye and the mind hang briefly in the air before landing on the solid ground of the next word. The weaving of repeated and near-repeated words through the poem suggests a gathering momentum. The most important tipping point in the poem is the one between nothing and something. This comes to fruition in the final stanza when the crucial change takes place from till to then. The process of transformation has begun with the alteration of a single word which changes the meaning of the line completely. In doing so, Surtzis brilliantly demonstrates in words exactly the kind of small act his poem champions. Form and meaning become indivisible. And when you're considering other poems to link to, the very different uses and effects of rhyme can be teased out by comparing Sertzit's controlled, elegant poem with the edgy humour of Leonidas Flynn's The Furthest Distances of Travelled or the grief and regret of Alan Jenkins' effect. The next poem is on her blindness by Adam Thorpe. And Thorpe is a poet, novelist and playwright. He was born in Paris in 1956 and grew up in India, Cameroon and England. And so this cosmopolitan experience is giving him an outsider's view of England, combined with a strong sense of Englishness, a theme which he explores in various genres. As a poet, Thorpe is consistently sympathetic in his observation of human life, particularly his own family's history, as well as the rhythms of social change in the natural world. He currently lives in France with his wife and three children. Now, when it comes to the poem itself, the sense of sight is often dominant in poetry, and so the poet's exploration of his mother's loss of sight makes the reader go into unusual territory. Thorpe conveys the impact on his mother through detail, which convinces us as coming from direct experience. His mother's difficulty with eating, her dodging like awkwardness, and the long list of things she did while pretending she could still see. All these give us a moving insight into the living hell she's trying to cope with. They also remind us that she's become the observed instead of the observing, a shift which has the potential for humiliation, though the narrator stresses she kept her dignity. The language of the poem is largely plain, conversational, with comparatively literal figurative language. One simile, as blank as stone, feels applicable to the poem's spare style. The only splash of colour comes at the end, in the description of the autumn leaf fall, golden, ablaze, royal, which are all reminders of the riches that the mother has lost. The mother's predicament is also conveyed through thoughts through uses of enjambement, not just across lines, but across stanzas. This breaking of units of sense across the white space between stanzas has a disorienting effect, making it hard for the reader to negotiate the poem's meaning. As in UA Fanthorpe's A Minor Role, dialogue plays a significant part. The second line contains a statement, one shouldn't say it, and this division between what can and can't be said runs through the poem. <laughs> 
The one time the mother is honest about her situation, the narrator is unable to respond with a similar candor. Most of the time she pretends she can see, that she's doing okay. Even when close to death, she maintains the fiction. It's lovely out there. The last line suggests that, even after death, she's subject to the comforting fiction, which likes to imagine the dead watching over us. Part of the poem's power lies in both the narrator's acknowledgement of the lies we tell ourselves in the face of fragility and ageing, and his regret in looking the wrong way. The title of the poem is an adaptation of a famous sonnet by John Milton called On His Blindness, written in 1655, after the poet's loss of sight became complete. In it, Milton initially chafes at his condition and how it limits his ability to serve God, but the poem ends with a resolve to bear his loss patiently for they also serve who only stand and wait. Thorpe's poem is partly a rebuff of Milton's stoicism of those who, like a Roman, put up with affliction without complaint. Another poem to compare it to in the exploration of the difficulty of talking honestly about physical decline are UA Fanthorpe's minor role, and whilst their contrasting use of the first person perspective results in very different poems, these two poems are really use worth considering comparing. The next poem to consider is Ode on a Grace and Perry Urn by Tim Turnbull. Now Turnbull grew up in the village of Ebbeston in North Yorkshire, and after leaving school, he worked for the Forestry Commission for eight years before moving to Cumbria to study forestry at Newrig College. And between 1979 and 94, he played and sang with a series of punk industrial bands. In the summer of 2004, he travelled to Germany to take part in the Poesy de Nebrasha project. And we find that, of course, he was awarded several Scottish arts bursaries and he's also an award-winning creative writer. He also worked as a freelance tutor and consultant specialising in adult literary publishing for various agencies across Scotland. Now when it comes to the poem itself, Ode to Grace and Perry on an Urn, this poem takes its inspiration directly from John Keats's Ode on a Gratian Urn, both in terms of its subject matter and its verse form. This relationship with an earlier model sets up many different resonances. Keats's ode was inspired by his contemplation of a Greek vase dating from classical times, depicting scenes from ancient life including lovers, gods, musical celebrations and religious rites. The poem grows out of the tension between the vivid sense of life conveyed by these scenes and their stillness caught forever by the artist in a moment of suspended time. Turnbull's poem is also about a decorated piece of pottery, in this case by the celebrated contemporary artist Grayson Perry, who won the Turner Prize in 2003. His ceramics are famous for his combination of classic forms with utterly contemporary decorations, which often feature scenes from the underbelly of British life, or at least working class culture, frequently derided by the more aspirational media. A class of cultures is inbuilt in much of his work thus. Turnbull's poem shifts this clash into the poetic arena, using the formality and literary heritage of Keats's original as a means of reproducing the tensions of Perry's work. In Keats's poem, it's the alienation of time which generates a distance between poet and narrator and the culture he's examining, and in Perry's work in his poem, it's the distance between classes, between the kids tearing up the suburban estates in their hot hatches and the kind of education and sophistication which knows what an ode is and how to use it. However, while acknowledging the distance between himself and his subject, Turnbull's poem, as is the case with Keats's original, seeks to empathise with or make a connection to the people depicted in the vase. This can be seen in how the language of the poem develops from stanza to stanza. The first stanza replicates much of the language a tabloid post might use when combining these young people, crap estates, lotus, bedlam. Turnbull sounds equally dismissive of Perry's art, describing it as a kishi vase knocked out by a Shirley Turnbull monkey. So, for example, do note that Perry is famously noted as a transvestite with a little girl alter ego called Claire. However, towards the end of this stanza, there's a shift as the poet recognises that Perry's art is more powerful and subtle than a mere tabloid expose. As Keats's Grecian urn, the artist has managed to convey both the frenetic physicality of these young people and a sense of peace. The shift is seen in stanza two, when concern for the safety of these kids as they indulge in their high-risk thrills emerges in the tender word children. 
Yes, their behaviour is antisocial, promiscuous, irresponsible, but they are, after all, only children. The bravado, hiding vulnerability and a hopelessness about the future which is for the rich. They also seem far more alive than the dead suburban streets and the pensioners and parents they horrify. Turnbull builds on this idea in the final stanza, which imagines a future poet contemplating a peri-urn, as removed from its context as Keats was from the world of ancient Greece. Confronted by Perry's garish celebration of the raw energy, the poem wonders whether, wonders whether this poet will find beauty and inspiration in these young people. The language at this point becomes more formal, more Keatsian in fact. It states, raised to level dust, free and bountiful. How happy were these creatures then? There's poignancy in this, as the rest of the poem makes clear, these young people are far from free and bountiful or happy. However, Turnbull's closing line, which echoes the famous dictum of Keats's poem, Beauty is Truth, Truth Beauty, is a reminder to all of us to think about how we look at others. Turnbull's and Perry's gift is to dignify these children, so often dismissed by wider society, so that they become fit subjects for art. And other poems you can link it to are Daljit Nagra's book We Have Come Into Dover, because like this poem, Turnbull's poem takes an inspiration from a classic poem in the past. Both demonstrate how poetry is an ongoing dialogue between poets across time. In its high mixture of culture and working class lives and the tension arising from these, Turnbull's poem also makes a surprising link to Haney's Out of the Bag. So that's all. If you found this extensive examination of the poetry anthology poems across the decades useful, do give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. But also don't forget to visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There you can find lots of revision material, worksheets, as well as model answers that you can use to help in your understanding and your writing of this anthology, but also lots of other subject areas. Thank you so much for listening.